Okay, <laughs> it looks like I think that we're live. Sorry, we had a little bit of technical difficulties getting started. Um, maybe if you guys can hear me and you can see me, just uh, send a message in the chat. That way I know that uh, it's actually going. I'll just wait for a second or so here. Okay, I think that we're, I think that we're live. Thumbs up, okay, perfect. So thanks everybody for kind of tuning in today. Uh, sorry, first of all, about the time change thing. Obviously, we're not uh, big football fans because we scheduled the first one during the Super Bowl. Um, but anyways, we're here right now. So if you've been to like the previous Q and A's, we've only done a couple. Um, what we're gonna do is um, you can, use the, the chat box here to like put in your question. And then um, Lauren is gonna be kind of reading through the questions and then she's gonna sort of be texting me the questions so that she can kind of, so it's, it's a little bit hard to keep up with the questions when you're looking at um, the chat. So um, that's what's gonna happen. Um, something new that we're trying for this one is uh, YouTube has this thing called Super Chat. So the way that it works is um, if you wanna make a donation, then you can make a donation and then you can have a message like pinned to the top of the chat or a question pinned to the top of the chat. Um, so that's something new that we're trying for this one. Um, I think that is about it in terms of getting started. Oh, right, okay, yeah. So uh, disclaimer, just getting started. Uh, I'm not a medical professional, I'm not a doctor or anything like that. And so I can't um, sort of comment on and give specific advice to you. Um, so, you know, my responses and questions are kind of just going to be based on my own experience. So um, it's always good to consult your own um, doctor or medical professional for kind of specific questions. Okay, I think with that kind of out of the way, we'll get started. So um, not sure if there's any questions here to begin with. There are. Okay, hold on a second here. Just getting started. <laughs> okay, questions are not coming through here. Let's see. Okay, so I think I'm just going to have to read the questions or hold on. Oh, okay, they're coming through on here. Okay. Okay, so first question is, is it possible to heal from schizophrenia? Um, so I think that I, like, I was just reading this book yesterday, um, and Lauren, do you want to pass me that book? This is probably a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. So I was just reading this book and, uh, I, I haven't made it all the way through this book. This is kind of the second, um, schizophrenia, family related schizophrenia book that I read. And in it, they were kind of talking about recovery and about how, um, you know, expectations for recovery kind of vary. And I think there's this idea that like you could completely recover from schizophrenia and it just, you know, you don't have to take medication or anything like that. But um, from my understanding and, and, and what I know so far, it, it's um, a chronic illness that you are going to have to use uh, medication to manage uh, probably for the rest of your life. Um, so the medication can help re like reduce the symptoms, um, but uh, the symptoms aren't going to just go away completely and you, and you kind of do need the medication as well as, um, you know, uh, other supports in your life in order to help manage the illness. So I, I kind of, I hope that that helped a little bit and answer that question. Okay. I'm um, going to just keep moving on here. How can people who don't suffer do more advocacy work? Um, Oh, okay. I mean, uh, there's, there's kind of just trying to think here. There's lots of like volunteer opportunities. Um, so I know that Lauren has volunteered at the Schizophrenia Society of Alberta and she's been doing like speaking engagements. 
there. And um, I know that it's, it's not just for, you know, people who are affected by the illness. There's people who speak there who, um, who are support people for, um, for people who have schizophrenia. So that's something. Um, just, sorry, one second. I'm just like, I'm so nervous here and I'm just like sweating. And so I'm just gonna <laughs> have to like regroup a little bit. That's why I'm wearing black, but okay. Um, hold on a second. Lots of questions. So let me just kind of take my time here. Does psychosis make it hard to communicate? Um, yes. So like the times that I, that I've experienced, um, Lauren having psychosis, uh, it, it does make it difficult to communicate. And I think, um, for me, it was in a kind of really unexpected way. Like, um, you know, I had read about the, the illness, um, before we kind of had, before I had kind of experiencing any episodes with Lauren and, um, it, when she did kind of have an episode, it didn't really happen like the way that I expected it to happen. And, um, kind of what ended up happening was, or I guess the dynamic that kind of created that occurred was one where, um, you know, she, she had stopped taking her medication and I think she, she felt she didn't need to take her medication and she, throughout that process, she didn't really want any like additional support. And I think kind of what was happening there was, was her feeling like, um, well, if she didn't, she didn't want to take the medication. Maybe she felt like she didn't, she didn't need, she didn't have the illness, um, or it wasn't affecting her. And so that, that her, her wanting to just say that she didn't need support was, was really challenging. And I could tell that like she was struggling and she was going through a hard time. Um, and what it ended up kind of creating was this like adversarial relationship, um, where I was trying to like help her, but, um, she was, she wasn't really having any of it and kind of feeling shut down. So, um, I think I kind of strayed away from the question there a little bit, but let me just double check here. Um, so yes, uh, psychosis does make it hard to communicate. Um, but I think I would end that question with just like, it is possible to still communicate. Um, and you have to take your time and you have to, um, you know, be really empathetic and you still can reach through to that person. I, I think. Okay. Um, how can a friend, sorry, let me read this first. Okay. How can a friend help a couple in your position? Um, for example, a, a girlfriend, very ill boyfriend struggling with his own health. Would it help for me to go to her psychology appointment or psychiatry appointment? Thank you for your videos. Um, uh, sorry, that's kind of like a, you know, a very specific circumstance, but yeah, I mean, I think that just like, um, when Lauren went through her most recent episode there, we had a lot of additional support in our lives. Um, so friends who, who, who did come and help, who did come help and be present with us, like in the hospital. And I don't think any, I, I went with Lauren into the like, um, psych, psychiatry appointments and stuff like that. Um, but if, you know, this person's, um, boyfriend wasn't able to go with her to an appointment, I think that like, for sure, if your friend is like up for having you be present, that that can be really helpful. Um, I know that like when, when Lauren was, um, wasn't well, um, it was kind of, it was actually kind of difficult for her to remember what was going on in the appointments or that she had even had the appointments. And so, um, having another person there who, who can remember what happened in the conversation and, um, you know, relay that information at a later time that can be really helpful. So, uh, but it doesn't have to be like going to appointments. I think that just, you know, 
offering to be there, offering to like come and maybe bring a meal or something that goes a really long way and is really helpful. Okay. How do you manage to take care of your own mental health as well? That's a good question. Um, and so I, I go to ther therapy myself. Um, and I just feel like, I kind of feel like if you're going to be in a relationship with somebody who has a mental, um, who has a mental illness, uh, it's, you know, it creates a different dynamic in the, in the relationship. And, um, it does, it does create additional stress and it's, it's kind of just an additional thing to manage. And, you know, I think that kind of under those circumstances, it's just a sort of situation where it's like therapy is a requisite thing. You're going to have things that like come up that like you need to deal with. And if you don't deal with it, um, then things could get a lot worse, I think for yourself. So, um, so taking care of your own mental health, like seeing a therapist on your own. Um, I think, you know, trying to also sort of be aware of, or be more aware of like how you're feeling and, um, and communicating like what it is you need. Like if you need more time for yourself, um, you know, I, I kind of thought that I would just be able to just, just completely put like her needs above my own. But when it's a situation that is, you know, really like ongoing and you're not sure how long it's going to last, that's where you kind of have to, you kind of have to say that like, I, I need to like recharge myself in order to be able to like help other people. Otherwise you're just going to crash too. Okay. Um, how hard was it for Rob to help Lauren with her schizophrenia? Um, I, I'll be honest that like, it was more difficult than I think, um, I expected. I mean, I, I didn't, I guess, really have any expectations. I didn't know at all, like what it would be like. Um, but I think that it's something that you kind of just, you, you grow into. And, um, you know, uh, Lauren and I actually, we see a therapist together as well. So it's lots of therapy. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think is going to just kind of be an ongoing journey for, for us is how we, um, integrate her mental illness into our lives in a way that, um, you know, feels really sustainable because I think that what, what kind of happens is that like, um, the mental illness side of things kind of tends to just throw your life out of balance. And so you're kind of constantly trying to like regain that. Um, and so kind of lost my train of thought there, but just a second here. Was it, how hard was it for Rob to help Lauren with her schizophrenia? Was that the one I was on? Okay. Um, so anyways, yeah, sorry, distracted. Um, I, I think that it's going to be a journey in terms of like, you know, integrating her mental illness into our life. So it's not going to be something that ever, we're ever just like, we're, we're good at that. Like we got past that. It was easy. I think it's, you know, it's just going to be something that we're, we're kind of doing all the time. Um, how do you help Lauren do well with her job and everyday life? Um, hmm. I think like, I think that the, the brief answer to that is just kind of, um, gentle encouragement, uh, where possible. Um, it's, it's hard because I think that, um, you know, I want to, I want to respect like her autonomy and her, like, you know, what, what it is she wants to do. And, um, 
and trying to figure out the like what's a good amount of like me kind of encouraging her to do something and her just like either wanting to do something or not wanting to do something um that that can get a little tricky sometimes and i you know i think that i'm i'm always trying to kind of be aware of that that boundary and it's, and sometimes it doesn't go well and I, and i get frustrated that like you know she's she's not doing something like you know school or work related or like keeping up with life kind of thing and um and so so that can be that can be kind of challenging um for myself sometimes um just read the question here one more time sorry I think, yeah, I think just my original answer of just kind of like um, gentle encouragement has, has always kind of worked um, the best for that. Okay, lots of questions. Thanks so much. What interventions would you recommend if you decide medication is not for you? Um, so I, I think that this, this question is coming from somebody like who, who has schizophrenia and is saying that they're deciding that medication is not for them. And like, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Um, you know, first, like, I don't, I don't really know how to answer this from the perspective of like, if medications are not for you, like I, I, I've, I've, how do I say this? I'm trying, I try to like give the perspective that like, like Lauren is in control of her medication. And if she doesn't want to take her medication, like I can't, I can't make her take that, her medication. Um, and that's something that's difficult to accept. Uh, you know, like in the beginning of our relationship, um, it, it was kind of the situation where like, I knew she had, she should take her medication. And if she didn't take her medication, then, you know, things could get worse. And so, um, so I would get frustrated if she didn't want to take her medication. And like, I'm just trying to think here. But I think you do, you really do have to accept that like, this is a person who is like, you know, their decision to take medication is their, is their own choice. Um, and so if they're, if they're choosing not to take medication, well, that's, that's a bit of a, like, it's a bit of a red flag because you, you kind of know that like, um, things probably aren't going well. If somebody's not taking medication, that's probably a point when they really do need to be taking medication. And, um, that, that situation has the potential to become um, become worse. Um, it, I think if you're thinking about not taking medication that like, you know, what Lauren and I have always talked about when it's, when it's that situation is first, you know, talk to your psychiatrist because, um, they're going to be able to help you make better decisions about how to adjust your medication. And if there's a side effect or something that you're um, not feeling comfortable with, then maybe they can help, help with that. Um, they can, they can probably also be a little bit um, helpful in terms of helping you reduce medication if that's something that you want to do. Um, and it's also just helpful to have a medical professional that's that's aware of how you're making adjustments to your medication. So not just stopping cold turkey. Um, and then, you know, let me just re read the question again here. Um, what interventions would you recommend if you decide medication is not for you? Um, and, then, and then I think that you would, I guess you, would, if you were just going off medication, you would want to let other people know that you're going off medication so that they can help sort of monitor things for you. And if you are in trouble and maybe you don't realize you're in trouble, then they can, they can help you, help you with that. I just, I feel like there's a lot of things that you can do, um, to improve your quality of life with um, schizophrenia, but I think that medication is kind of essential and, and all the other things kind of build around that. 
Um, okay, I'm going to move on to another question here. How do I help my husband accept his illness? Hmm. A lot of these questions I wish that I could just be like, Lauren, you, you want to take this one? So <laughs> um, we'll have to do one together. Um, how do I help my husband accept his illness? I'm just trying to think about how, like, you know, I approach things like with Lauren and, and I feel like, you know, I'm, I feel fortunate, I guess, in, in the fact that like, uh, she, she does accept her illness. Um, I think, but, but, but what does that mean? Because there's still, there still is like situations or, or times when she doesn't want to take her medication or, you know, she, you know, she had a recent episode this past year. Or so, but what does that mean for acceptance? And I think what that means is that kind of acceptance is, is a journey too. And, um, that's like, but, but now I'm trying to think of like, well, what are the first steps? And I think, I think that like educating yourself about the illness, um, that, that, uh, that can kind of go a long way in terms of like your, really your own acceptance. Um, kind of, I would think that maybe like gentle reminders about like how, um, how they, how they could kind of improve their quality of life. So I know that for, so for example, for Lauren, um, um, sleep is, sleep is something that's really important. And I can tell when, um, she hasn't had enough sleep and, um, it just kind of disrupts her schedule and she, she just doesn't feel well. Like I can tell when things are off and sleep is a big, a big thing like, like to do with that. And she, she kind of knows, I think, but, um, but she still like wants to stay up late and, um, that kind of thing. So she's giving me like a dirty look now. Um, <laughs> And so like, I, that's a situation where I'm kind of just like reminding her like, oh, you know, like, like sleep is really important for you. You should, you should try to get to bed, that kind of thing. But again, it's like, it's, it's boundaries, right? I, I don't want to, I don't want to create this situation where like I'm nagging her and that creates resentment. And so, um, so trying to just be like gentle about, um, things that you, you think, uh, might help with with various symptoms. And so I don't even really know that ha that, that has to do with specifically like acceptance. It, I think like what that's doing is that's just kind of dealing with like how, like, like the, the symptoms that you're aware of and, and maybe like how it could improve um, his life. And so, I mean, acceptance would be a nice part of the equation where like you, you knew that he accepted the illness, but, um, but that, I think that's going to happen, like, you know, there might be acceptance and then it's going to go down and it won't be acceptance. Then it might go really high and, um, you know, it might be up and down. And so I think kind of approaching it from the symptom side might be a little bit more helpful than trying to like have this goal of like, we've reached acceptance level. Okay. So I think that I'm dragging on a little bit on these questions. So my apologies about, um, about that. Um... Okay. When in psychosis, do they know that they're in psychosis? Is that their reality? How can you help if they don't believe you when you're trying to help them? Um, I think Lauren did a, a video recently and, um, I don't know if we've published it yet or if it ha I think that she had talked about kind of how, like when she was in psychosis, she kind of has a bit of an understanding that she's in psychosis. So, um, so I mean, that might not be the case for everybody, but I think that, the, that there's, that there might be like, um, a level of a bit of a level of an awareness there. Um, and that might be helpful in terms of trying to communicate with them in terms of like, what, you know, 
what you're what you're observing um, might also match up a little bit with like how they're feeling. So that might be kind of an, an avenue to approach it in terms of like communication. Um, how can they help you? How can you help if they don't believe you when you're trying to help them? I, um, okay, so a couple things here. First, I mean, I haven't, uh, I, ha I haven't really had to deal with that specific situation if they don't believe you when you're trying to help them. Uh, I think it's, it's more been a case of just like refusing to, to accept support. So maybe a similar situation. I think, you know, I think what's what would be really helpful in terms of approaching the situation is kind of having a plan before things get bad having an understanding of like okay like what what do what do i do when um when things seem like they're not going well um one of the things that we had recently released on on the channel was the sort of concept of self-therapy videos so um you know when your husband is well it might be helpful for him to create a video of himself on his phone, like saying like, you know, other people in your life are noticing that maybe you're not feeling very well. And, um, you know, it's important for you to, to listen to them and to accept support, that kind of thing. I think that that situation might be helpful. You know, it doesn't have to be a video. I think that that's, that's fast and easy to do. You could do something like writing out a plan, having um, him write out a plan specifically. So, Talking about these things kind of before you're in the situation, I think can help a lot to, to deal with the situation when you're actually, when you're actually in it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Lauren is like whispering stuff to me. She said that there is a super chat. So thanks very much for that person who, um, who super chatted. Um, thank you both for what you're doing on this channel. It has been a huge help for me to know I'm not alone. Question, does Lauren work a full-time job? Um, and I kind of wish that she was here to answer this. Uh, she, she doesn't work a full-time job. Um, she, she worked like a full-time job uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And then um, she she went to school, um, and so she was doing like school full time there, and she was also kind of working as a research assistant um, at at the university, and um, and then she took a leave of absence from school, kind of um, if you've been following kind of along with like what happened uh, last year, and she had spent some time in the hospital, and so um, she's still on a leave of absence from school, and um, and she's working more on this site now. So that's kind of on this channel. So that's kind of what she's doing right now. Thank you very much for your question and your super chat. Um, okay. Just give me a second to read a question here. How can you tell if what your partner says is a hallucination or based on reality? As a partner, it's hard sometimes for me to differ between the two when some hallucinations seem like they could be real. So, um, I, okay, so from my experience um, with, with Lauren, uh, when, when she has had hallucinations, they, they seem, um, they they're primarily auditory um there there are some situations where it's like um visual but it's not like it's not like I, the auditory hallucinations are are clear and the um visual hallucinations have more been just like there's a shadow or something like that so and she and she's able to communicate that to me and she you know I, she knows that that it's that's a hallucination um i think she's she is i you know, from my communication with her, she's quite aware of like, you know, what is a hallucination? And, um, and so 
I, I guess I, I feel fortunate that there's that like distinction um, and um, we're, we're kind of able to communicate about it and it's not, not a big, not a big deal. Uh, I can sometimes tell if, um, if, if she's not doing well and um, there's, and she's, and there are auditory hallucinations and she's distracted by them. But that's kind of the extent. Um, it, it's not so much, let me just reread your question here one more time, sorry. Um, as a partner, it's hard sometimes for me to differ between the two when some hallucinations seem like they could be real. Sorry, I'm not totally sure what to make of that question at, at the end, but as a partner, it's hard sometimes for me to differ between the two um, when some hallucinations seem like they could be real. Um, you know, I, I, guess, I guess the final thing that I would kind of say on this question is just that um, you can kind of encourage them to reality check with you. And so if, um, if you suspect that they're hallucinating, um, you can you can ask them like if they're hallucinating and if, if, if they, and you know, encourage like conversation around that. Lauren doesn't always want to really talk about that. And that's something that like, I think would be more helpful in, in communication. And so something to work on, but um, encouraging reality checking and she can say, she can, or they can say like, you know, are you seeing this? And you can say, I'm not seeing this. So it's like a hallucination. So that, that might be something that's helpful for you in terms of like, um, helping them um, discern um, hallucination from reality. Okay. Sorry, I'm getting a little mixed up here. How can you help someone believe you when they're in psychosis? I know it's not beneficial to go along with the delusions. How can you help with that? Um, okay, so, uh, you know, one specific thing that comes to mind is, um, is when somebody doesn't want to take medication and maybe they have, um, maybe they have delusions about um, feeling like the medication is poison, um, Another instance would be like not wanting to eat food because they think the food is poisoned or something like like a, a delusion around something like that. Um, so in in the past, like my approach has been uh, has been to be like, you know, the fact that you don't want to take medication right now um, is kind of an indication of why you need to take medication right now because you know you're feeling like y you you don't you don't have the illness or, or that the medication is poison or something, which means that your symptoms are, are kind of bad right now and you really do need the medication. So, um, so that's, that's, kind of, I, I don't know. I, I've read that you're, you're not supposed to really like, you're not supposed to, you, you're not supposed to try to rationally deal with, um, with address delusions. And I, I, I kind of agree with that because, it, you know, the approach that I was just suggesting where you do kind of try to reason with them, it, it's not, it's not totally the most helpful all the time. Like it, it hasn't, it hasn't always helped me in the past. Um, but I think it maybe helps a little bit. Um, I'm not sure. I kind of lost that one here. Hold on a second. Do you think that it was helpful? Sorry, there's so many questions. I'm kind of getting a little bit lost here now. Another approach with respect to delusions, I think is, um, especially if a person is like scared and Lauren has kind of talked about this before is like, you know, not there, there are other situations where like, you know, about like people are, are hallucinating or people, they, they can't, 
I'm just trying to think of a specific situation, one that I had read about. Um, like somebody who was walking down the street and they thought that like, you know, the, the cracks were like, they were going to fall down into the cracks. And the person who was with them being like, okay, like, you know, I hear what you're saying, but can we still just keep walking? So trying to like work past delusions in that way, I think that that's like another, another approach that you can take is just trying to like, trying to just acknowledge them and then move past them. Sorry, it took me so long to like get to that conclusion. How often do you practice self-care and do you ever feel burned out at, by your role as a caregiver? Um, the self-care thing, like, you know, I had kind of talked earlier about like us trying to like integrate her illness more into to our lives and like self-care is an important aspect um, for Lauren as well. So we, I think we try to like self-care together, which isn't really like self-care, I guess that'd be more like co-care, but like, um, you know, st staying like physically active is a big thing. Um, like we, there's a bunch of hobbies that we enjoy doing. Like we, we spend a lot of time together and I think that like that, that's helpful. Um, sorry, just one second here. Lauren sends a message. There's so many messages and Lauren sends a message and then it goes back up and like, I can't find where it was that. Oh, okay. Um, do you ever feel burned out by your role as a caregiver? Uh, like, you know, the relationship that Lauren and I have right now, it's not one where like, I'm like, I'm her caregiver, like, you know, all the time. I think that it's like, it's very like brief, um, instances where, you know, like when she was in the hospital or bef like before, the, like right before the hospital where it's like, it's, it's more of a like situation episode where like it, it requires a lot more of my like energy and, and time and, um, and love and, um, and that, that, that adds up, like, especially when you don't know like how long that's going to last and that, that can, that can make you feel burned out. Um, but you know, the rest of the time, I think the role is more of like a support, support role in terms of just like, you know, um, asking her, if, just reminding her, if, has, have you taken your medication tonight just in case she just, so, so she doesn't forget. Or, um, you know, if I notice that she's, she's struggling, like she's in, she's in bed a little bit longer than, than usual or for like a day or something like just kind of checking in with her and seeing like encouraging her to kind of like try to break out of those patterns. So that's kind of the like more like ongoing role. And that is not, um, that's not, you, I, you know, I don't really burn out from, from that. Um, but if you are in a situation where, um, you know, it, you're more of an ongoing caregiver role, I think that what you, you do need to do is understand that like you, you will burn out and that you do need to take time for yourself and self care and have therapy and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, these are great questions. Thank you everyone. Okay. How were your experiences with your family friends when they learned that Lauren has schizoaffective disorder? Um, I, I feel really fortunate, I guess, that like, um, family and friends have been really supportive. Um, I guess, you know, there was, there's, there's probably like, a bit of, um, I'm just trying to think of like what it was like telling my mom and, and I can't even remember, like, I think my mom was just, was, was supportive. I, I was more nervous about telling people because I, I wasn't sure like what their understanding of the illness would be. And I know that, you know, there's a lot of kind of, there's a lot of like 
misconceptions about it and there isn't a lot of there's not as much awareness about um, schizophrenia as other mental illnesses and so um, I guess I was I guess I was worried what people would think not because I was ashamed but more because if they if they had those other like misconceptions about um, schizophrenia then it could cause fear and so um, I do remember just it trying to trying to set things up so that it was all like an open conversation and if people had questions like that they could ask so but it but it went well like family and friends were were loving and accepting um rob do you have any advice on explaining schizophrenia to your children and when to do so so um we have started to talk to our kids about about not not specific specifically schizophrenia and um, like, I don't think they would even know what that word means, but we've talked about, they have a good understanding about like what, um, or not a good understanding, but they have, we've started to develop an understanding about what, um, mental health is, um, and the importance of mental health. We've talked about, um, how people's brains can get sick. And so that's kind of the level that they're at. And, um, our kids are four and seven. So I think that's kind of a good level for now. Um, but, and that's what I think, I think you kind of have to do, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing discussion with them. You can sit them down and you can, you can explain something that you think is going to be really important. And they're just going to be like, okay, can I go watch Pokemon now? Like they're, you, and then they'll ask a question like days later that shows that they were, they actually do care and they actually were listening. And so it's this ongoing conversation that's going to evolve, um, I think in terms of complexity until they, they have a much fuller picture and understanding of what's what schizophrenia is. But we have started those conversations. Um, are there any books you recommend? Um, this one, uh, it's called, I don't know if, how easily you can see it. It's called Surviving Schizophrenia Family Manual. It's by E. Fuller Torre. Um, I haven't read the whole thing, but I, I really like it. Like I like his, it's, it's a little long, but it's it's easy to read, and I like his um, his attitude about about it. Um, and then I read another one. I'll see if I can find it and maybe link in the description. It was the first one that I read, and it was a short one that kind of you know kind of went through the the fundamentals of schizophrenia. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll see if I can find that and link that. That was a good one as well. Somebody, somebody also asked, I have the fifth edition of the Surviving Schizophrenia book. Uh, this is the sixth edition. This is the seventh edition. Newly revised and updated. Um, is it worth worth it to get the latest new edition? I'm not sure because I haven't read the like older edition, but um, but maybe. Uh, it does seem like he, he like adds different like um, sections and stuff. I mean, you could maybe just look on Amazon and see what your table of contents looks like compared to the new table of contents, and that might help you. My son is in the beginning stages of treatment and is in the hos in a hospital. What can I expect when he comes home? Um, I, I I wish that Lauren could weigh in on some of these things. Uh, you know, um, I think that like for for Lauren when she came home from the hospital recently, um, she like she, it, it it she was still in recovery, but it was. Like, you know, she didn't need to be in the hospital. And I think maybe what you could expect from your son when he comes home is, hopefully anyways, is that um, he just, he just, you know, that's, I'm reflecting on the question a little bit more now. I'm thinking like, oh, that's, that's kind of complicated. I mean, I don't know who your son is. I don't know what it's like. So I'll, just speaking about, you know, my experience with, with Lauren, I think, you know, she just needed a lot of, um, kind of, she needed a lot of love and, um, and I knew that she was like, she was, she was getting better. And so I think 
there's maybe just space to like know that like we're going to take it day by day and it's it's going to get better each day is going to get better and 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 it did so if you know if he's coming home from the hospital and he's home from the hospital and he's well enough to be released from the hospital um then then i think that you're you'll be okay um sorry that's not the most incredible answer there but um i i guess you know reflecting on it actually a little bit more and, and taking into account like some of the things that Lauren has said, I don't know that people who leave the hospital are always like well prepared for like reintegration um, into, into the community. Lauren didn't even like a social worker didn't even like sit down with Lauren. She didn't have no, like a psychologist didn't sit down with her or anything like that. And I know that that's a big criticism about um, people who leave the hospital and they weren't ready to leave the hospital. So, um, so maybe you know, considering that aspect of things, um, it's probably also a situation where you, you want to kind of, I don't want to say like, keep an eye out, but just like, make sure that, that your son knows that you're there for them and that you want to support them in any way that, that you can. And if there's anything that you can do to help, like, I think that's the best that you can do. There might be things like, um, I think peer support groups, I know that Lauren has found peer support groups really helpful. So seeing if there are any peer support groups um, in your area, that might help with that transition from hospital back to home and back to, you know, regular life. Um, question for Rob, do you have your own personal experiences with mental illness? Um, for example, do you suffer from depression, um, seasonal affective disorder, bipolar, what have you? Um, no, um, not that I have been diagnosed with. I mean, not that I would even suspect myself. I think that I, um, a pretty, I think that I'm pretty like, I think I'm just trying to think like maybe seasonal effective, but no, I, I think that I, I, I've, I've been okay and that it hasn't been something that I have, um, that I've struggled with. Um, do you get frustrated with the burdens of supporting Lauren? I have paranoid schizophrenia and, uh, feel my support team gets frustrated with the burdens of my mental illness, that the, with the burdens my mental illness brings them. Um, I think that this is an interesting question because I know that um, I think something that Lauren struggles with is not wanting to be a burden on other people. And so when I read your question, I kind of got that impression. You you probably don't want to be a burden on other people as well. Um, this is a, I think this is a complicated question. Um, for, for me personally to answer because, because of the relationship that I have with Lauren and I, you know, we've talked about how like we've, we've had relationship, um, conflict in the past. And, um, as I think a lot of relationships have relationship conflict and, I, um, and that's something to like, that's something that I know is like kind of, it's kind of triggering and it kind of, um, it can kind of sometimes be difficult to discern like whether something is relationship conflict and how it, how it blends into like, you know, triggering and symptoms and stuff like that. And so it's hard to specifically answer your question because, you know, sometimes like sometimes I get frustrated with Lauren because, because we're in a romantic relationship with each other and, um, you know, we live together, we spend a lot of time together and sometimes we frustrate each other. She's just smiling at me now. Um, I guess I feel additional pressure though, in terms of understanding how like relationship conflict can be triggering in our, in our, in, in with her mental illness. And, and so I don't know. I don't get frustrated with the burdens of supporting Lauren because I don't feel like it's a burden to support her. Um, I, 
<laughs> She's smiling at me now. Um, I feel like, you know, the way that it, I feel like, and the way that I would like to like approach um, mental illness and relationship is that like, it's, it's something that like we're both taking on. And it's unfortunate that like she is the person who is in the relationship and has, and is, and has the symptoms and that kind of thing. But it affects, it affects both of our lives and, and figuring out how to like accommodate the illness so that like, you know, we both have a, you know, a good quality of life and we're both, we're both happy. Um, that's, that's kind of the goal. My long winded response though, I, I don't think that you should kind of, you know, communicate with, with the people that you feel like might be getting frustrated about, about, um, about supporting you and find out like, you know, are they feeling like it's a burden and that's a hard conversation to ask and, you know, let them know that maybe you're concerned about like feeling like a burden and, um, and if they need to like get additional supports themselves, that's important. So I think that communication is important in that situation. Okay, a few more questions here, maybe a couple more questions, and then I will probably wrap this up. Um, I have a partner who is an amazing caregiver, but I know it takes a toll on him sometimes. Is there anything Lauren does for you that helps you? Um... I feel guilty, like spending a lot of time, like thinking about this question. I feel like I should just like know right away, like this is the stuff that she does that helps me. You, you know, I think the biggest thing for me that, that I really need, um, is, is communication about um, about the illness, um, about how she's feeling, about what she needs. And, and sometimes that's a struggle. Um, but when she is able to communicate, like she knows the importance of that, um, that to me. And when she is able to communicate with me about that, I, I, I do feel like there's more room to sort of navigate the situation a little bit better. And so, um, I would say like, that's something that's really helpful for me. Com good communication, um, around, around the illness, because it's hard, it's hard for me to like know what's going on all the time with her. Um, even though like, you know, I, I check in a lot. Um, but it's, it's a situation where like, I know she doesn't want to be a burden and, um, and she doesn't need to share everything with me if she doesn't want to. So, so, but me knowing kind of as much as, as possible, I feel is, is really useful and helpful. Um, okay. And I, you know, I, I just one more thing to that. I feel, I feel really appreciated by her and I feel really loved by her and she, she communicates that to me and, you know, I don't feel like, I don't feel, I don't feel like she doesn't care about the fact that, that I, that I, that I want to support her and that I, that I care a lot about her. I, I know that, um, that she cares a lot about me and she's grateful for my support. So that's really helpful. Um... Oh, this last question is a hard one. And Lauren and I have talked about it. If you could take Lauren's condition away in a moment, would you, or do you think it makes her the person she is today? Well, I think that like, definitely, um, you know, it makes her the person that she is today in terms of, um, like the empathy that she has for other people. Um, but I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't think that I would lie about the fact that like this, it's a chronic mental 
illness and um, it affects your quality of life. And um, like you, you don't want to see somebody else um, suffering when, when they're suffering. And so if I could take it away, I would take it away. And, but I, but I can't. And so, you know, I think it's, it's kind of a question of like, well, what's the next best thing that you can do to help um, support someone and help um, reduce the suffering that they have in, in their lives when they, when they encounter suffering or struggling, that kind of thing. So, okay. Uh, I think, I think with that, we'll probably wrap this up. Um, I really appreciate all the questions that everyone has asked. Um, I hope that some of my responses were helpful. Sorry, it took me a little while to kind of get into things. I was feeling really nervous about doing this. I don't know how Lauren has managed to do these last two ones. She um, stays really cool under pressure. Um, so that's it. Um, we have another video coming up this week. Make sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done so. Um, if you want to support the creation of uh, future videos, also make sure to check out our uh, link to Patreon, which should be down below. And I hope that you all have a great day. If you're watching the Super Bowl and you're a sports fan, football fan, enjoy that. And we'll talk again soon. All right, take care. Bye.